quiet. Don't we usually sing before the sermon? <laughs> Happy birthday! <laughs> wow. <laughs> Okay, 95 is not that big a deal. I acknowledge that. In five years, when whoever's the pastor here says, happy birthday, I would like you to do a way better job of responding. There we go. Thank you, Jeff. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday. Oh, that's so much better. I feel better now. <laughs> I want to say something before we really begin the sermon about the scripture readings. Um, and starting backwards, or well, I guess it was forwards, with the passage from Corinthians. I know it's going to be hard to remember that because that long passage from Mark is probably spinning in your brains. But I just have a very simple thing to say about Corinthians. Reading Corinthians in uh, worship is always, uh, I find, pretty entertaining because the motivation, you probably know this, for those two letters to the church at Corinth, actually there were three of them and somehow ended up as two, was that those, <laughs> the church in Corinth was substantially naughty. And Paul was writing to them over and over again, which was a big deal back then, to try to sort of, most of the time gently, um, get them back on the right track. And the particular passage that we heard today comes from a longer lecture um, about the roles of, that various members of the church serve and what we heard today had actually to do with preaching, although you would never know that from, from what we heard. Um, and I bring it up at all because there's one verse in that whole passage that um, has always stayed with me throughout my life, actually, since I first heard it. And that one line is, and so we do not lose heart. And for our purposes today, I would like that to stay with you as well, because we're talking about the church today. And Paul was talking to a nascent uh, Christian community, one of the early churches, about how to sustain itself in the midst of double persecution, persecution from Rome, so political oppression, actually, and beginning to be a lot of persecution from other Jews about what was going on in this, with this crazy group of followers. So bear that one phrase in mind, we do not lose hope. Mark. We got sort of everything Mark had to say on Jesus' behalf about, I know you will never have gotten this because I had to do a lot of homework to get it, who's in and who's out. Now, I'm not convinced that Jesus was terribly worried about that issue. I think Jesus was much more concerned with getting us all in and not really terribly worried about who belonged on the outside. But there's a lot of stage direction in this passage that gets sort of mixed in and hard to follow. But let me try and map it for you. Um, Jesus is out with a whole big crowd of people whom he has just brought in. Jesus goes away, he comes back, he goes in. It says in the text, he goes into the house. Actually, a better translation would be, he goes into the home, his home. And the backstage part that isn't so clear in there is that his blood family is also in that house, in that home. The, next, the final stage direction is there's a lot of arguing going on about who's in and who's out. Is Jesus within Judaism? Or is he, in fact, Satan outside of Judaism? And Jesus says, if I'm someone who doesn't divide but instead binds, then I'm in my home, my house. I know it's so confusing. And the very last part is all of a sudden his blood family has found themselves outside. And they're calling Jesus, come outside from this new home that you're constructing. And Jesus basically says, no, this is my family here. And we've interpreted that passage over the years as a definition, Jesus defining who the church is. Just a little dull. And Paul could have said it, as always, in about 10 words instead of the 400 that we heard. <laughs> 
for Mark, I'm sorry. So who's out and who's in? 95 years ago, there were a group of German Reformed folk who were members of the German Presbyterian Church in Madison because there wasn't a German Reformed congregation and they were unhappy. They felt outside. And so they formed the beginnings of Memorial Church and Gary back there has a direct tie to one of those founders, his great-great-grandmother, I'm going to say her name wrong, so I brought it up here with me, Amelie Kinchi, was one of the original members of Memorial Church. She and some other families, a total of 60 people, were the original Memorial Church. And um, there are these cool brochures that Phil did for the 90th anniversary of the church, and a lot of the information about how our church began is in this bulletin, and I betcha we could get you copies of, the, is it your mother who wrote Amelie's? So, right, I'm sorry, this is all very confusing because it's defining who's in and who's out, and as we know, that's not so easy. At the 65th anniversary, 60, yeah, fifth, um, Gary's mother read a sermon <clears throat> as though Gary's great-great-grandmother was reading it and I'm, I'm not going to read it to you now, but it's really wonderful, and I would love for you to read it if you can get a copy, because Gary's great-great-grandmother defined for Memorial Church who's in and who's out. And you will never guess the concept she used, the construct she used for defining who's in and who's out. You'll never guess it in a million years. So I'll tell you. Faith. And that theme of faith is what sustained that little church from its beginning of 60 members who were meeting in the GAR hall to what we have today. Those of you who've been around as long as me or longer than me, and we are precious few, remember that it was not a straight line from the GAR hall to Fitchburg. There were lots of little detours. And depending on who you talk to, um, who's in, meaning who's the church or where's the church, what's the church of your youth, um, will differ a lot. For Carol and for my mother, um, the church wasn't even our last stand at Madison Street. It was before that on West Johnson. So the church, that little congregation, moved and moved and moved. I want you to remember that number 60. That was an important number because... When the church went to uh, build its first building, there were about 60 people who made the commitment to build the building, and that first building never really got off the ground because the Depression came. <coughs> By the time the church had been at, Memor at Madison Street <coughs> for quite a few years, actually, in the early 60s, the membership had built up to 500, and at one point there were over 200 children in the church school. A little hard for us to imagine, but... Think of the context. In the early 60s, a church of over 500 plus members wasn't a big church because that was the time in the culture, our culture, when there was a huge amount of pressure on everybody to go to church. And if you didn't go to church, um, you were thought of as somehow odd. So that doesn't mean that I'll, I don't want to suggest that those people weren't faithful. I think they were, but they had a lot of support, cultural support. In, to attend church and to get their kids enrolled. And I'm one of those kids who um, was a product of the Eisenhower era and the prosperity of that time and the conventionality of that time that filled the pews. Well, things changed pretty quickly in my lifetime. We went from a pretty big Sunday school to, uh, when I was in college, one child in church school. And a long and sort of painful conversation began then about what to do next. And in the end, it was 64 members who made the decision to move from Madison out to Fitchburg. And that generation, even of those members, um, that included my dad and some of the other older folks who are now gone, made the decision to come to this location and build this building. The important thing for me 
as I read the church history and as I thought about what I know about all of the moves that we've made, is that um, Gary's mother, when she wrote her piece in the 70s, really hit the nail on the head about what it is that makes it possible for churches to sustain themselves through incredibly difficult times, and it's faith. By the time the church gave up the Madison Street property, I was ordained and living in Boston, so I had a secondhand experience of that time. But one of the things that I remember, and Carol Williams and my mother have reminded me of this over the years, is that those 60 people knew that what they were doing was beginning a new thing in a new place, and that they were going to have to help, they didn't think of it this way probably, but they were going to have to help the people they were hoping to attract to understand what makes it possible to be in. What did they have to do to really make the doors open here? They had to have faith. They had big time faith. I remember worshiping with them at Nicolay in a, in a room with folding chairs. And from there to this, it's kind of mind boggling. They had to have faith that what they were doing was gonna work. And they had to start to redefine again who's in and who's out. 60 people were in at that point. That's not enough to sustain a church. So how are they gonna make it possible for more people to come in? And they said two things, Mom. We're never gonna say didn't work. And the second one was, do you remember, Carol? We always did it that way, and um, something along the lines of, and, it, and we can't do that thing because it's never going to work. They were going to be open, in other words. They were going to be open to the innovation, to the ideas, to the inspiration, to the faith of those who were outside back then in a way that would make this place open and more people would feel inside. There's something this church did that is extremely important to me personally that helped me to feel inside. You could argue, since I was born and baptized here, I was confirmed here, and I was ordained here, that there is not a better definition of someone who's in. The problem is that for about half of my life, I left half of my life more than half of my life out. And to coin a phrase, it's because I wasn't out. I'm a lesbian, and I was sure that if my grandmother, a almost lifelong member of this congregation, found out that I was a lesbian, that she would die. It would kill her. And there's only, I think only um, children who keep secrets from their families can understand the force of that conviction. I mean, did I know logically that having a piece of information about me was going to cause my grandmother's heart to seize? Yes, I knew that that was ridiculous. Did I know what it might cost me in terms of my relationship with my family and my larger relationship with this family? The stakes were quite high. And so I hid that part of myself from my church. It was easier because I was out in Boston most of this time. Until a crisis came in my life. I mean, let's face it, I didn't hide it very well. <laughs> but I didn't officially bring all of myself in until about five years ago when my life started to fall apart. I had cancer, I went into remission, my partner of 25 years left me, and I lost my job, I lost my church. And at that point, I'd lost my health, I'd lost my relationship. In losing my church, I lost my home and my income. And when I looked at my life about four years ago now and realized that in many ways I'd lost everything, I realized I had to figure out what to do. And the one thing I had was Memorial Church and my family. So I thought about it for all of five or six seconds and decided it was time to come home. By the time I came home, because my family had asked for prayers on my behalf, I was officially out. <laughs> and I cannot tell you what it meant 
to walk into this sanctuary for the very first time in my life out. All of me came in here. And that's because this church has continued over the years to think about where does our faith direct us and who does our faith direct us to bring in. And one of the marks of Memorial Church is that even throughout its well, entire history, that conversation has never stopped. How can we be more open? How can more people be in and fewer people be out? In fact, that language that I'm using about who's in and who's out is pretty dangerous language, and I don't think it's language Jesus would have used. For Jesus, everybody's in. Jesus made it clear that God loves all people, period. The task Jesus laid before us was figuring out how to make that real for ourselves as individuals, for ourselves as communities, for ourselves as children of God, members of the worldwide community of God's children. We've done other things in our history to help make in bigger, stretch our arms wider. And those are things that I'm very, very proud of. I'm very proud of the fact that my grandmother held the mission of the church at her heart, to her heart. There was nothing more important to her for the church to do than to finance, to promote and support missions beyond the walls of this congregation. She carried, and her generation carried that tradition of the importance of mission with them into the founding of the United Church of Christ in 1957. And we continue to be a church that takes mission, service, and care of others very, very seriously. And we continue to expand. You know, who are the people that we used to think were the others? Now we're thinking about prisoners this year and realizing that prisoners are not out, they're not other, but they're a part of our communion. I have served a church in my time that had very strict definitions of who was allowed in and who was kept out. The obvious people who would come to mind who wouldn't be allowed in because it was a theologically conservative congregation were people like me, which was kind of ironic since I was their pastor, gay people. Um, they didn't like people who weren't white. They didn't like people whose theology differed from their theology. And that church had actually been working hard on dying for about 90 of its 95 years in existence. Um, when I first went there, my area minister said to me, Lisa, you're going to this church to help it die. And so I prepared myself for that. And was there for a few years, and a former pastor who had served during World War II came to visit, and he said, this place is so vibrant, and it's still here, and I don't understand that, because when I came here, my area minister said, Bill, you're going to this church to help it to die. <laughs> they started with a congregation of about 200, and today they have a congregation of about 60, because they've worked really hard to make sure those doors don't open too far and that not too many of those people outside are allowed to come in. We have the reverse story here. At the time of the move, we had about 60 members, and I brought this with me so I would know. In 2006, there were 267 members of this church. As long as we try at our very, very hardest to understand that our task is not to define a clear line, a closed door, to separate ourselves from those who are outside, Memorial has great possibilities in its future. As long as we decide that we are people of hope, that we will stand together, we will be a vibrant congregation. And Mark, we heard Jesus say, a house divided will not stand. Memorial Church, for 95 years, has been a church united, a church that invites, a church that is open, a church that rejects the notion of us and them. That continues to be our task. Today, 
we can practice with twink. We can practice hospitality and openness and helpfulness and support. You can wear your name tags. <laughs> that's the easiest way for twink to get to know us. But we need to remember as our central message, our faith keeps us united, our faith keeps us open, our faith allows God to be present in this place. Amen.